Hey everyone, it's fantasy football season, so I need the best sleep I can possibly get, which is why I'm pumped to be back home from my trip and sleeping in my Lisa mattress. A quality night's sleep helps you recover from distractions faster, prevents burnouts, and make better decisions, improve your memory, and overall just make fewer mistakes. It's not marketing, it's just science. To design a better mattress, Lisa leveraged 30 plus years of experience and hundreds of hours of testing to develop the perfect mattress for all body shapes and sleeping styles. Lisa's mission is to provide a better night's sleep for everybody. Through their 110 program, they donate one mattress for every 10 they sell. That's more than 26,000 mattresses and counting. Lisa strives to leave the world better than found it, but that doesn't stop with mattress donations. Together with the Arbor Day Foundation, Lisa plants one tree for every mattress they sell, and they're committed to planting one million trees by 2025. Don't miss these summer savings. Get $160 off a Lisa mattress at leesa.com slash fantasy pros. Let's talk some football. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester, joined by Mike Tagliere as always, and you can find us on Twitter at Bobby Fantasy Pro and at Mike Tagliere NFL. Tags, what's going on, man? What up? News just came across that Des Bryant, as we knew, he was uh, visiting Cleveland. I just thought about this. Is Des Bryant going to be the new like LeBron James in Cleveland? No. Why would that be the case? <laughs> like the savior. Like he's he's viewed as the savior. I don't think so, dude. They've got Josh Gordon and Jarvis Landry. Des is the third or fourth fiddle with Duke Johnson there. And David and Joku, who they all love. You didn't even mention Baker Mayfield. I think Baker Mayfield's probably the LeBron James. Oh yeah, they gotta love Baker. He's tasked with uh returning that franchise around. Or you know, maybe Francisco Lindor or Jose Ramirez, who might be the two best players in baseball besides Mike Trout. Nah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think they care about baseball as much <laughs> as football. <laughs> so here's what we got planned today. Um, Dax and I are going to be doing our running back tiers. We've had a ton of people ask us, hey, when are you guys going to do this? And we figure drafts are coming up a lot of them this weekend, so we need to get this in quick. We're probably going to do wide receiver tiers, I'm guessing, next week. We've already done quarterback and tight end. You can go back to listen to those. A lot of the news is still relevant. If you have more questions, again, you can tweet us at Bobby Fantasy Pro or at Mike Taglier NFL. But before we get into that, I want to remind you all about a limited time offer we have going on that's going to help you dominate your drafts and the entire season. And by the way, Tags, like when, when you hear limited time offer, I'm always like, yeah, right. I'll get that deal in a few weeks when I want to get it. I actually mean limited time, though. Like, seriously, if you if you want to do this, you need to take advantage of it now. Drafts are right around the corner, and you all can get our highest premium package for six months for just 10 bucks total. Or if you're already a premium user, you can extend for just $10, again, for six months. All you have to do is go to fantasypros.com slash offer, or if you're already a premium user, go to fantasypros.com. And the way this works is you have to deposit $10 to draft.com to do these best ball drafts like the ones we've been doing on our episodes, or you can do weekly DFS lineups where you actually live draft against other opponents like that we do at the start of our season long leagues. It's an absolute blast. So it makes sense. You can win money with the $10. It's a great offer. Six months premium upgrade to our highest package at fantasypros.com slash offer or fantasypros.com slash extend. So Tags, I wanted to uh, get back at you for something on Monday's show. And to be honest, I don't even really remember what it was, <laughs> but uh, I promised I would get back at you. So I want to be a man of my word. That means we're playing Does Tags Know Everything? Uh, I think we've already learned this in past episodes that Tags does not, in fact, know everything. <laughs> yeah, but I know, but I want to rub it in, okay? Is that all right? <laughs> and our listeners love it. So I'm, I'm ready to embarrass myself again. Why not? <laughs> we know that you know everything about fantasy football, but it's time to find out if you know everything else as well. Are you ready, Tags? I'm as ready as I'll ever be, I think. Okay, man. So today's question is actually sitting on a tee for you. And that's pun intended because it's a simple baseball question. Mm, I thought it was going to be golf. Uh, no, it's, I don't know anything about golf. How could I ask you anything about golf? You said on a tee. You said it's going to be on a tee. I think golf. Okay. Well, I mean like the, okay. Yeah. I guess so. Like <laughs> tee balls on a tee. That's not baseball. Yeah. It has nothing to do with golf. I don't know anything about pop culture either. So I always look up these answers, but this one I knew. What two teams played in the World Series last season? Is that easy enough for you? I don't think you're going to get it. I, I know the Astros won it. I do know that. Um, and I want to say that. They went to the American League, right? So when I grew up, the, the, the Astros were always National League. And I remember this because like even in 2005 when the White Sox won the World Series, they beat the Astros. They were National League. And I want to say that Jody Smith tweeted something like a couple of years ago or last year. I can't remember what it was, but something about the Astros going to the American League. And I was like, what? 
So obviously, I know that if so, if they won the American, who was the National League team? The Cubs lost in the playoffs. Uh, was it the Dodgers? <laughs> you gotta be kidding me! I'm sitting here the whole time thinking, "Oh man, this is gonna be so embarrassing for him. I'm gonna love it." And then you nailed it, dude. You got it. Ah, yes. Wow, you know everything, dude. <laughs> Only useless uh, like uh, sports information. <laughs> I don't know anything about pop culture. I promise you. Okay, man. Well, there's really not too much news to talk about. I mean, Dez is going to sign with the, with the Browns. Well, it seems like he's going to sign with the Browns, and I don't think that's really exciting. He's still drafted in, what, the 10th, 11th round? Yeah, it's not exciting. I think the only thing that does it does, it does for me, it's gonna he's going to obviously be drafted higher than I'm willing to take him, but if he does sign with them, it's really going to hurt David Njoku because, again, guys, he's just not a big yardage guy in this offense right now with the players they have, and if you take Dez, Dez is like, still probably top five red zone guy in the game so if you put him in the red zone he's going to get those targets i'm really pumped that david and joke having this big preseason because that means people are going to start drafting him ahead of trey burton and jordan reed and i'm all for those guys falling to me i legit got a question earlier today actually uh in regards to that exact thing should i draft david and joku over trey burton and jordan reed and i was like no well that's good that, that someone's asking that question because that means a lot of people are probably thinking it Oh man, that preseason game did wonders for his ADP, and I'm going to see him live uh, actually tomorrow night. I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to be at the Browns Bills game, which is like the weirdest game to be at. But I'm uh, I'm partaking in. Uh, Brad Evans was on the show yesterday. Him and Bob Long have put together a, a draft where I'll be out in uh, the Canton at the Hall of Fame. Actually, I've never been there, so I'm pretty psyched about it. Um, but yeah, so if you're at the Browns Bills game tomorrow, like tweet at me, tweet it like you know Jeff Ratcliffe's going to be there, Mike Clay, Brad Evans, I think Andy Barron's might. I I I don't know. There's what a group man yeah a lot of people there so hopefully you guys see us hit us up and uh, let's hang out there's not really much else to talk about i mean unless you want to talk about Dak prescott saying tavon is like going to be used all over the place i don't buy that for one second i also don't buy the notion that chris carson is a bell cow that's even more than a workhorse they're saying he's a bell cow now <laughs> yeah right i don't even want to talk about it. i wanted to mention it just so i could say yeah right but there is one other thing delaney walker being evaluated for a lower body injury and uh, this is something that concerns me a little bit. Mike Vrabel saying that he's not even going to tell the media the extent of his injury. I don't know if I'm drafting Delaney Walker ahead of Trey Burton at this point now. Well, it's it's a little murky, but what I, from what I heard, it was a mixed practice with the Bucks, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Delaney Walker, someone heard him say that a defender came down on his toe. So if a spike went into his toe and if it's just like a laceration, I'm fine with that. Obviously, if it's a different injury like turf toe or something like that, that's something I want to say that he dealt with that part of last year and he's still he produced uh, decently. So I'm not going to put Trey Burton ahead of him right now, uh, but it's definitely something I'm going to pay attention to. OK, well, that's all we have for news. Um, but first, I want to talk about one of the sponsors of today's show. They made fun of me on my Keelan Cole bold prediction on yesterday's show. So you better believe I'm going to be watching his next game on NFL Game Pass. Only with NFL Game Pass do you get every out-of-market preseason game live. The top rookies, comeback players, new players on new teams, it all happens in the preseason, and it's going to give you a huge leg up to actually see players playing football. I can't wait to see the Jags take on the Vikings this weekend because I'm going to see what they have in DJ Chark, who they've been raving about. Uh, I get to see Keelan Cole and get to see you know, if he's going to be used as much as he was in those last five weeks. With NFL Game Pass, I can watch DJ Chark and Keelan Cole against one of the best secondaries in football. And if I miss the game, so what? I can replay it after it's aired. Whoever you want to watch this preseason, you'll need NFL Game Pass to do so if you're out of market. Will Baker Mayfield win the starting quarterback job? How's Jordy going to fit in with the Raiders? Can Kirk Cousins take the Vikings to the next level? Make sure to watch all the action this preseason with NFL Game Pass. And best of all, you can kick off the 2018 NFL season with a seven-day free trial of NFL Game Pass. Sign up now at NFL.com slash Fantasy Pros. Game on. All right, man. Let's just get right into the running back rankings here. And uh, what, the way we're going to do this is we're not just going to go, you know, this is my number one, this is my number two. We're going to talk about them in tiers. And I'm looking at this first tier. I think most people would either say it's Todd Gurley and Le'Veon Bell or Todd Gurley, Bell, Johnson, and Zeke all in one tier. I disagree with both of those. I want to hear what you have to say, though, first. Yeah, I have Gurley and Bell in the first tier, and the, and the other three are not. Like, I wouldn't consider anybody else with the first two picks outside of those guys. I have. I, I think it's easier to distinguish Gurley over Bell than it is Bell over Elliott, Johnson, and Barkley. So I have Gurley in a tier all by himself, and then the next four in a tier. 
I don't know, man. The reason I say that Bell's in the girly tier is because the upside is just as high. Like, in terms of what he can do with his offense. Like, he plays in a top six scoring offense, as does Gurley. So that's why you gotta love these guys. They're workhorses and high scoring offenses. They both have good offensive lines. And Le'Veon Bell, I mean, let's not pretend, the guy has finished as a top three running back in every, basically every season that he's been healthy since his rookie year. So he's always there. He's one of the safest picks. And again, if, if Brandon Cooks does take some target upside away from Todd Gurley, don't be shocked, I guess. But I, I, again, I'm taking Gurley number one. I just think he's the safest with the whole holdout thing with Le'Veon Bell and if they punish him. But those two are definite, definite first tier. Gurley just had one of the best fantasy football seasons in the past decade. And Le'Veon Bell's never been up where Todd Gurley was last year. And Gurley might get more carries. If they're not blowing people out this year and they actually run him like they did in the playoffs, that's who Todd Gurley can be. I wouldn't be surprised if he laps the field this year. He basically did last year. Yeah, like I said, I have him at number one, so I, that's who I'm taking at number one. But again, Bell is definitely in that tier. And if you told me that Le'Veon was going to play all 16 games, I'd say you, you've guaranteed yourself a top three running back. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Now, he's not exactly durable, uh, with that said, Zeke missed some time last year. David Johnson missed some time last year. So I'm still taking Bell over those guys. And everyone's going to say, well, Zeke was more efficient when he actually played than Le'Veon Bell was. Yeah, that's true. Indy has a better offensive line. But Le'Veon Bell is is game script proof, right? I mean, if they're winning, they can still run the ball with him. If they're losing, they'll still pass the ball with him. He's one of the best receivers in the NFL. Oh, and he's going to rush for 1,500 yards. So I got Bell over Elliott. And then David Johnson, he's not going to score 20 touchdowns again. Uh, that offensive line is not good in Arizona. So, like, Le'Veon Bell, Zeke are fairly close. David Johnson's quite a bit behind. And then Saquon's ride on David Johnson's tail for me. Is that how you have these guys? Uh, so I have it. And that's the thing. I like putting them in tiers because I'm not going to fault anybody to say they'll take Zeke over Barkley or anything like that. Um, I have Barkley, Elliott, and David Johnson in the next tier. Those are the, the three clear next running backs that you should be taking off the board. And the reason I have Barkley ahead of that, I like on top of my tier. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to fault you because that's why I have them in the same tier. I think you can make the argument for any of these guys, but they're all locked into 350 plus touches. We know that, you know, people tell me David Johnson's a workhorse. Well, so is Saquon Barkley. So is Ezekiel Elliott. These guys are, so is Leonard Fournette. And Dalvin Cook. Exactly. But what you're looking for, you're looking for the potential of a high scoring offense. You're looking for a guy that could finish as a top three running back. And and to, to play on a on a bottom ten scoring NFL offense, which I kind of project the Cowboys and the Cardinals to fit into, it's really tough for a running back to get there. Don't forget, Ezekiel Elliott scored nine touchdowns in ten games last year. That's I, I don't see Ezekiel Elliott scoring fifteen touchdowns. And if you could tell me that he was going to score fifteen touchdowns, yeah, I'd say I'll take him over Barkley. I'll bet you the Cowboys are top twelve in the NFL in score. Scoring this year in scoring, I'll take a bet. Let's, I'll bet that one. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll figure that out offline. But I'm a big believer in the Cowboys' offense this year. I know the receiving core is not great. News to you guys, it wasn't last year either. And Dak Prescott, before Ezekiel Elliott got hurt, was the number three fantasy football wide receiver. Zeke is one of the best in the game. This offensive line is the best in the game. I think they're going to be great. The defense is not going to stop anybody, but that's also going to help them score more points. I don't know, man. I, 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 well, if the defense can't stop anybody, that's going to do more for Dak Prescott than it will for Ezekiel Elliott. I'm, 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 what I'm wondering about is how much are they going to use him in the passing game? Cause they're talking about using Zeke in the passing game. And I, I tend to believe them on that because they don't have a choice. They need a safety valve. Jason Witten's gone. And as much as people want to dog Des Bryant and, J and Jason Witten, they were staples of that offense. There is nobody, no defensive coordinator who is walking into a game plan and saying, all right, how do we stop Alan Hearns, guys? How do we stop Rico Gathers? Rico Gathers isn't going to play. Dude, he's like their third tight end. We don't know that. Nobody really knows the depth <laughs> chart that they have out there in Dallas. And what I'm saying is just like, it's, it's a nobody. You're not worried about Terrence Williams beating your defense. Like Ezekiel Elliott. It's going to be worse than Leonard Fournette last year. He's going to see eight eight man fronts a minimum of 50% of the time. And that's really tough to dominate against. Like he'll still put up respectable numbers. But again, I just don't see him getting to that next level. I just don't think so, dude. I just don't think so. Because Dak Prescott is light years ahead of Blake Bortles. Uh, I, I, I actually like Dak Prescott, but when you don't have the options to throw to, it's really going to hurt. Like, it, it, I don't know, man. And again, going back to David Johnson, a lot of people are going to hate me on that. I don't, I love David Johnson, the player. I really, really do. Uh, but the, he has a new head coach, guys. He's going to be used different. He, he, like when you, when you introduce a new offense, look what it did for Todd Gurley. So it could go the exact opposite way for David Johnson. Like, I'm not saying it's going to. I think he's going to be a tremendous workhorse. Like, he's going to get the 350 touches. But again, his offensive line is terrible. It was bad before, uh, Shipley went on IR. Their starting center is on IR now. He's not playing. So it's like, 
It's bottom five in the league, yeah. It's so bad. So it's just like, you know, he's going to need to be using the passing game. But as I mentioned the other day, you know, Larry Fitzgerald is targeted a whole lot. I don't think you're going to – Christian Kirk, they're talking about getting him the ball. He's not a deep guy. He's an intermediate-level receiver. You have Ricky Seals-Jones, who is expected to take a jump. Like, I just don't think the targets are going to be where people thought they were with David Johnson before, you know, uh, back – like they were back in 2016. And the touchdown upside being part of a bad offense, it's just – I think 12 touchdowns is being generous. When you watch David Johnson play, it's easy to see why people would think, well, I should take this guy number one overall. I, I think he's maybe as talented as Todd Gurley, maybe more, same as Le'Veon Bell. If you take David Johnson on the Steelers this year, I'm drafting him first overall. But he's not on the Steelers. He's on the Cardinals, so he's my number four pick. Yep, if David Johnson was on the Rams, I would absolutely take him number one overall. Yeah. So we've got Saquon Barkley in our top five. A lot of other people have Alvin Kamara, maybe even Melvin Gordon. Now, I don't have Kamara or Gordon in this next tier. I've got Leonard Fournette and Dalvin Cook. Eh, I do have them in the next tier. Fournette, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, and Melvin Gordon are kind of that next tier for me in that order. Who do you have? Uh, for me, my next tier is Alvin Kamara, Leonard Fournette, and Melvin Gordon. And again, no Dalvin Cook? I do not have Dalvin Cook in that one because, I, again, that's another team that's going through an offensive coordinator change. We don't know what's going to happen. What we do know is that Latavius Murray was really good last year. Um, he, he did really good in the role that he was asked to play. And I'm not, I'm not saying that Dalvin Cook's not going to be the workhorse because I do think he's going to get a majority of the work. But I'm not going to sit here and pretend that there's not a few question marks that I have. Their offensive line also in Minnesota is not very good. They also lost a starter on their offensive line recently. So... I'm not going to sit here and pretend there's not question marks about Dalvin Cook. You know, guys like Kareem Hunt, there's question marks around him. Is the workload going to be there? You know, with Spencer Ware coming back, are they going to involve him more in the offense? Yeah, what are they going to do to sit Spencer Ware on the bench and not use him? He was a top 10 running back two years ago. Yeah, and that's the thing is like, even last year, if you guys look at it, the boom bust and everything in between series that I did. So Kareem Hunt, he totaled 91% of the running back carries last year, which is like literally a number that doesn't happen. Like it doesn't happen in the NFL ever. Like next best was under 80, right? Well, there, yeah, that's the thing. There's only four running backs over the last five years who have totaled more than 80%. So it's like ridiculous, like how much that was. But even despite that, he finished as an RB2 or better just 62.5% of the time. So when you look at a number like that, you're like, wow. So if he loses any workload, it's going to hurt, right? It is going to hurt. And he is going to lose the workload, yeah. And not just that, but the team, we talked about the defense being so bad that, you know, it's like it's going to force them to throw more. That's the point that people are making for Tyreek Hill. So why are you drafting Kareem Hunt up there with uh, ahead of guys like Leonard Fournette and Melvin Gordon? Alvin Kamara, Leonard Fournette, and Melvin Gordon are in Tier 3 for me. They're first-round picks. I think Kareem Hunt and Dalvin Cook, I think they belong in the second round. What about Devontae Freeman? You haven't mentioned him yet. I, I have Freeman ahead of Kareem Hunt. Wow. So you see... I, I, from a talent standpoint, I love Devonta Freeman, but I can't escape kind of what uh, the Falcons did last year. When you start, like you started seeing the work like come down as the year went on, he received 12 or fewer carries in eight of his last 10 games in 2017. That's not good. Like, especially when you're talking about a- He was playing injured, wasn't he? Am I, am I forgetting? He was playing injured, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. No, it's just, he, um, he had a, I want to say it was concussion earlier in the season, but then when he came back, it was just like they, they wanted to get Tevin Coleman eight to 10 touches per game. So they were kind of just splitting it up. And I still like Freeman as a player and I still think he's going to have those crazy weeks, but he's not being used as much as a receiver anymore either. And when you add Calvin Ridley to the offense, that's not going to help matters. So knowing that Tevin Coleman on the last year of his deal this year, it's just, there's some question marks around Devonta Freeman. Freeman, and that's why he's in that next tier for me. You know who has the most fantasy points in the last three years of any running back? Devontae Freeman. Is it? Oh, yeah, because Le'Veon Bell was... He's finished number one, number six, number 13. That's not a good trend, but I think he's a safe running back, man. I'm not so sure that Kareem Hunt is that safe. That's how I feel about him. I think you could sit here and talk about Devonta Freeman and Christian McCaffrey as two running backs who should be in a similar area of your draft. Like, I, I like think about it. In terms of like workhorse, is it possible that Christian McCaffrey gets more carries this year now that they're talking about getting him so much? The way that McCaffrey's using the passing game, you can't say that Devonta Freeman's going to be used more than that. So it just comes down to the offense, right? Because I think Devonta Freeman's going to score more touchdowns. Uh, but again, I, I, I really don't understand the argument to, to put Don, Devonta Freeman even close to the category of guys like Alvin Kamara, Leonard Fournette, or Melvin Gordon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've got him fairly close. I mean, we've seen his upside. And it's the best running back in football. Now, granted, Shanahan's gone, but this is a very good offense. Carolina, I'm sorry. You don't have a very good offense. Your quarterback can't throw the ball very well. And Christian McCaffrey, like as much as I want to say he's going to get a ton of touches, you look at all the talent on their roster, 
I don't know if it's there. I mean, Greg Olson, over the past three years, I saw this stat. I don't remember. Graham Barfield, I believe, posted it. Over the past three years, his uh, share of the targets is higher than anybody's was last season. That's a three-year sample size, 26% target share. I'm starting to come around to Greg Olson, and that means Christian McCaffrey's not going to get as many touches. That's essentially what you have to decide, right? And I'm, I side with McCaffrey on this one. I feel like Olson's getting older. He's not as, as versatile. And I think that Cam Newton had a safety blanket in Greg Olson for a long time, and it's, and it's turned to Christian McCaffrey. Uh, so I, you, you kind of have to pick your poison between those two. You have to think one of them's going to fall off, and I think it's Olson. Uh, but at, I want to go back to Melvin Gordon, though. And the reason, like Kareem Hunt, I mentioned yeah, last year the, the, the share that he had in finishing as an RB2 just 62 percent of the time melvin gordon guys this is with antonio gates and with hunter henry playing the last two years melvin gordon has posted rb2 or better numbers in 24 of 29 games and and on top of that they're talking about they said that they're they're disappointed they haven't used him as much as a wide receiver as they would have liked which is crazy because he was like in the top five last year in terms of usage in the passing game so melvin gordon is going to be a top like if you were to tell me that melvin gordon's going to play all 16 games he's not going to get dinged up I would, I would probably draft him in front of Alvin Kamara. Like that's the, the thing is, is I, Gordon's in that tier with Leonard Fournette. I think the upside is very similar with those two because Gordon probably has a a higher ceiling in terms of the offense, but I think Fournette is just uber talented and he's going to get tons of volume. The offensive line improved, so that's why those three are just in a tier above these other guys. You know, Fournette's a lot more injury prone too. Of all these guys we've talked about, all we've talked about twelve running backs so far. If I had to bet on one of them getting injured, it would be Leonard Fournette. Sadly. Yeah. So, okay. So those are the top 12. We've got Freeman, Kareem Hunt, Christian McCaffrey. Or do you have Joe Mixon ahead of Christian McCaffrey? Or McKinnon? I have Mixon ahead. I actually have Jordan Howard ahead of McCaffrey as well. It's close. It's really close. I mean, those are the guys I have in that tier. I have McCaffrey, Mixon, McKinnon, Howard, and then a huge drop off. So hold on. I want to ask you a question. Someone brought it up to me and I, and when I first read it, I was like, no, but the more I thought about it, the more I, 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 so why should Joe Mixon not be considered in the same category as Dalvin Cook? As Dalvin Cook. Hmm. Why? So here's the thing. So here, because here. we've seen Dalvin Cook have the workload. We're hoping Joe Mixon has the workload. But that's the thing. It was, it was really just a four game sample size and it was under Pat Shermer. And then Latavius Murray got a chance to play in the offense, impressed his coach, played really well. Now, and then, so Mixon, I mean, are you worried about Gio Bernard the same way that you're worried about Latavius Murray? I'd, I'd argue them comparable. Latavius Murray has more touchdown upside than Gio Bernard does. But what I'm saying is, like, when you think about it, Dalvin Cook pl- plays behind a bad offensive line. Joe Mixon. So does Joe Mixon, man. He's not playing behind a good one. They did <laughs> upgrade it this offseason. They added two pieces to it. So I'm not going to say they didn't upgrade it. But they're not great offensive lines. Joe Mixon's a better receiver than Dalvin Cook. Um, you know, the team in terms of defense, I think you're going to get more passing, more targets out of Joe Mixon because the Vikings just, they have an awesome defense. It's just, I, I, the more I thought about it, the more I was kind of like Mixon should be considered with Dalvin Cook. And I have him in that tier with him. I'd take Dalvin Cook 13th, man. I'd take him 13th overall in the draft ahead of DeAndre Hopkins. I would take, I probably would take, yeah, I, I think I'm with you on that one. It's close. I, so you'd take Joe Mixon like 15th? Yeah, that's where I'm kind of at with it, dude. Like there was a long time where I was like, ah, I'm losing all the ceiling with Mixon. But in the end, you know, a pick in the top two rounds, if you want your guy, you have to get him. Like you can't say I really like Joe Mixon, but I'm not willing to to reach two spots for him. So I, I had to think about this and say, why shouldn't I consider him in that tier? I think Look. McCaffrey's the same, though. I think McCaff- like I mentioned on the Bold Prediction Show, I think he's got that upside. Now, I'm nervous about him, just like I'm nervous about Joe Mixon. I-, I know you think McCaffrey's safe. I think he could lose a lot of targets. But I also think he could have that 360 touch a season that would propel him into a top five running back. Um, so, I mean, I think all three of those guys are fairly similar. It's just... I don't know. Maybe it's recency bias. Maybe I need to reevaluate Dalvin Cook. McCaffrey's just not built to handle that role. That's my issue with him. Like I'm, I'm being realistic when I say this is that I'll always look at the optimistic side. But when you look at the size of Christian McCaffrey, I'm sorry, he's not gonna ha- he's not gonna withstand 360 touches. Like guys like Joe Mixon are built to handle that. Dalvin Cook even is a shorter, more stable uh, running back. But when you guys when you see guys like Reggie Bush and Christian McCaffrey start to get up in those touch ranges, th- it's gonna be really tough. And honestly. When you have the best goal line back in the NFL and Cam Newton behind you, you know, we talked about that stat the other day on the podcast is that I want to say no, uh, no Panthers running backs have combined for more than I think 10 touchdowns over the last three years. Like it's just, you don't score many rushing touchdowns with Cam Newton there. Yeah. Cause they didn't have McCaffrey. That's why they drafted a guy 10th, 10th overall, was it? 
But but that's the thing. You, you, they drafted him high, but I I don't think that he's that player. He's not Leonard Fournette. You can't use him like they use Leonard Fournette. Yeah, I mean he's five eleven, two oh five. Devontae Freeman was the number one running back in fantasy football, and he's smaller than that. He's like five nine, two oh five. So he's he's a he's a more stubby like like Dalvin Cook's six six foot two oh eight. I mean he's pretty similar to Christian McCaffrey, and McCaffrey is jacked. I didn't think Dalvin Cook was that tall. Yeah, no, I'm not saying McCaffrey's not in good shape. I wish I was in shape like Kish McCaffrey is. I really do. I'm not saying that he's not in shape. I'm just saying that he is not. Like, when you look at his statue, he looks more like Gio Bernard than he does Joe Mixon. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason he's one of the best. He was the best wide receiver in last year's draft class. That's what somebody said, right? He's kind of got a wide receiver's build, but he plays running back. All right, man. So, I mean, we've got the same guys in this area. Hunt, McCaffrey, Mixon, McKinnon. Howard, do you have anybody else that even sniffs that tier? McCoy. McCoy, yeah, I don't. Um, and it's not exactly because, you know, the, the McCoy suspension thing is kind of looming. I would give that a 15% chance of happening. So if you're not drafting McCoy because of that, I think you're doing it wrong. I think that he is going to play. Um, he hasn't exactly been the most reliable running back, though. That's my issue. He keeps getting worse with time. This Bills offense is going backwards. I mean, they're going to have Josh Allen passing the football. <laughs> <laughs> or Nathan Peterman. I don't know if that's better. I actually think it is better. I think AJ McCarron will start the year for them. That's my take on it. I don't still. It, he's the worst quarterback, starting quarterback in football. If AJ McCarron's the starter, right? Fortunately, when you're a running back, you don't have to rely too much on accuracy. That's why Christian McCaffrey was able to catch so many passes last year. Even though, even though his, his in terms of among running backs, he had one of the worst worst catch rates. And because it's just Cam Newton's not accurate, no matter where on the field. Uh, LaShawn McCoy, again, when I, we talked about in this in the value episode where LaShawn McCoy is a running back who you're getting in the third or fourth round now who is guaranteed to carry the ball 250 times. Like, you can't find running backs like that in the fourth round. You just can't do it. Um, there's going to be some guys who do reach that level, but you can't guarantee me that. You can't guarantee that, you know, uh, Kenyon Drake is going to get to 250 carries. You can't guarantee Alex Collins. LaShawn McCoy, you can. It's going to be boring. It really, it really is going to be boring. I'm not saying it's going to be exciting to own LaShawn McCoy, but to sit here and say that you think Jarek McKinnon is going to be more stable for your fantasy team, I think it's a little mistake. It just depends on what you want on your team. So it's kind of like, who, who are your first two picks? Do you need to get, do you need to add a little safety to your roster? I think McCoy provides a little bit of safety, but he's not going to give you the upside that he has in years past. I think that's fair, man. But I mean, I would rather have Mark Ingram than LaShawn Le- McCoy. You're going to get an RB1 for, I mean, he's playing 12 games. You'll probably get an RB1. What, seven of them? Yeah, I would say seven or eight games, but yeah, that's better than McCoy's going to give you. But again, he's occupying one of those bench spots in your first, in the first four weeks, which there is a value to that. Yeah, yeah, there definitely is a value to that. I guess you're right, man. I don't know. I, I've still got Ingram over McCoy because I, re- I mean, I plan on making the playoffs in all my leagues. I think I'll be fine. Okay. In these expert leagues, it's more of a competition and nothing against the people I play at home against, but I do this for a living. Like I get paid to do all this research. So I think I'm going to make the playoffs and I'm going to plan to have the best team going into the playoffs. That includes Mark Ingram over LaShawn McCoy. And I, I, I mean, that's a risky draft plan in my opinion. But again, once you get Mark Ingram back, you have like an RB1 or RB2 every single week. So, I mean, I'm not against drafting Mark Ingram as a top 20 running back. Um, but paying over someone that like LaShawn McCoy, who's going to be on the RB2 radar every single week yeah. because of all the touches he receives, I'll just take the stability of that. Let me ask you this. Like, what is the worst RB1 you would allow on your team? Is it, is it Joe Mixon or is it jo- Jordan Howard? Yeah, I think it's Jordan Howard. I think that's where I cut it off. Um, Well, Jordan Howard, Trisha McCaffrey, that tier. Uh, McCoy and McKinnon are high-end RB2s for me. Uh, But yeah, I would not want to go in with Jarek McKinnon as my RB1. Absolutely not. I'd be fine going fourth round Royce Freeman, fifth round Mark Ingram. Go ahead and get Marshawn Lynch and Carlos Hyde in seven and eight. If I have those four running backs... I think my team's just fine. I could, you know, load up at tight end, even quarterback, or just go three wide receivers early and be thrilled with my team. I w- so I'm 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 weird in this way where I always want at least one running back who's a top twelve guy, and I always want one wide receiver who's a top twelve guy. From there, I'll go any direction. I might go four wide receivers, one running back, but I want studs. That's not weird, man. Most people are with you on that. I need a stud at each position. So I mean, that's the thing is like I'm I'm anti strategy, but I almost always end up with at least one and one because I want a guaranteed producer at the position and I don't feel as much as we like Royce Freeman it's hardly a guarantee in my really competitive leagues I'm always wheeling and dealing so I don't care about which position I have the strength I just want the best values I'm going to figure out how to spin them into what I need come playoff time so 
Um, I'm a little bit different in, in that way, but I'm one of those crazy guys. You've got a trade offer from me almost every week. Yeah, for sure. It, well, <laughs> this is the area of the draft, though. Like, once we get outside those guys, like McCoy, I can't put in this range because this, this next tier is, like, so nasty. Like, I don't – you feel dirty, like, picking these players in the spots they're going. But when you look at everything as the landscape, you're just like, I guess. I mean, so Alex Collins, uh, Sony Michelle, Lamar Miller, Ronald Jones. I don't even know if he belongs in this tier anymore. Mark Ingram, Kenyon Drake, Derek Henry, Royce Freeman. You've got them all in that same tier. In JHI. Yes. I could make the argument for any of these guys to be like legitimately picked ahead of one another. I think Alex Collins might be and, and Alex Collins and Lamar Miller. I would, I might put them in the, in the tier together because those two, I believe are the safest of this area, but this is a giant tier and one that used to include Rashad Penny and Ronald Jones. They have slipped down into the next tier. For my for this tier, I've got LaShawn McCoy right at the top, Royce Freeman, Marshawn Lynch, Jay Ajayi. I know you don't like that, but I'm coming around to the idea that, you know, just because it didn't happen last year doesn't mean it's not going to end up happening. Towards the end of the season, Ajayi was getting more and more touches in the playoffs. They used him a ton. I think it might be happening. I'm not, it's risky enough that I'm not willing to draft him ahead of Royce Freeman or LaShawn McCoy or Mark Ingram. But there's a lot of upside there that I've been finding myself getting them lately. <sighs> I can't do it, man. I, I That's fine. I, I totally understand. I was with you two weeks ago, but I'm starting to think I, I might have been missing the boat. Well, hold on. So the reason that I'm not drafting many running backs in this tier is because I don't I feel dirty. And I, I mentioned that, right? So I just did a live stream on our YouTube channel. If you guys haven't subscribed there, by the way, go there, youtube.com forward slash fantasy pros. And when you subscribe, get notifications because it'll send you a notification when I go live. Uh, I just did a surprise kind of like live stream to answer some questions for our listeners and followers. And um, one of the things in there was about JGIE. And I said that I do believe he's going to finish as an RB2. I actually, I have it in my plans to rank him as an RB2 in terms of, and like projections. I think he's finishing there. However, the ride there is going to be extremely bumpy and you're not going to feel good about it. And the reason is because Darren Sproles is still on the roster. If if they cut Darren Sproles, I'll have a different conversation with you, but Darren Sproles is still there. He's the guy that Doug Peterson has always given the, the, the majority of snaps to. Okay. We, we can see the production going both ways. Corey Clement is not falling off the roster. He, 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 he got some hype. He actually re- played really well in the Super Bowl and he's going to have a role this year. So when you have a three headed monster at running back, this reminds me of Joe Mixon last year when I told people, I, I love Joe Mixon, the player. I don't even like Jay Ajayi, the player though. Like, I don't think he's that, that uber talented that he deserves so much. He was so inefficient last year. Now, but he was really good when he got to the Eagles. He was good. He had a few big runs that padded those numbers, though. I'm not going to sit here and say that. In the game that he had so many carries in the playoffs, the Eagles were stomping in that game. Like, legitimately, it was a non-contest. So, again, I, the Eagles offense is going to regress a little bit this year. If, if Carson Wentz isn't ready, that's that's concerning. If Alshon Jeffrey's out, I don't know. I would assume that's probably going to help Jay Ajayi get into the end zone a little bit more because they're going to run the ball rather than throw it to, you know, some secondary options. So, Again, I think Ajayi is going to give you a lot of RB2 weeks. I think you're going to get RB2 weeks maybe 50% of the time. But I also think that you're going to be looking at your lineup and being like, what the hell did I do this for? Mike told me, don't draft Jay Ajayi (laughs) as the 18th running back off the board. Like, if he was going in the RB25 to 28 range where it's like right after the RB2s are off the board, I'm okay with that. Because again, you're going to get some, you have some built-in equity into your pick and you could live with the ups and downs. When you're taking a running back in this range, you're hoping that he's going to be an RB2 or better at least half the time. It's a good argument, man. And I want to clarify something. There were a lot of people that hit us up last year and said, that argument for Isaiah Crowell not drafting him, that sucks. Because we kept saying Isaiah Crowell had like four big runs. Besides that, he was a complete dud. And they're like, well, yeah, he did have those four big runs. But the thing is, he's not some breakout runner. Same with Jay Ajayi. He just had, you know, we happen to have the holes. He probably went untouched on three out of the four of them. And he went, took it to the house. I mean, Marshawn Lynch takes it to the house sometimes. He's not fast or anything. It's not like he's Reggie Bush or Tyree Kill or anything. These guys regress, and they regress backwards. I think that's going to happen with Jay Ajayi this year in terms of efficiency. I just think he's going to get more targets. So that's where Tags and I differentiate. Uh, I'm with you. Collins and Lamar Miller are my next guys. And I've got Carlos Hyde and Duke Johnson in that tier now. Oh, wow. And I know I'm high on both those guys, but this is a great offensive line. Carlos Hyde, I think, is the clear starter in, in Cleveland. He was an RB1 last year. Uh, I think he he's going way underdrafted. I got so many shares of him right now. And then Duke Johnson, he was just awesome last year. His role's not going to change. 70 receptions, book it. 
I have them two down actually two tiers from where we're at right now. Um, now the reason is because I do believe that there's some point in the season where Carlos Hyde could lose his job to Nick Chubb. Now, I don't think that's the, the way it is to start the season. So again, if you want to pair Carlos Hyde with Mark Ingram, that's fine because you're going to have a running back for the first couple of weeks and, and you don't have to worry about it. But I would take guys like Rex Burkhead over those guys all day. Like Rex Burkhead deserves to be up in this other tier. Like, and I'm, as the time passes, I'm starting to move him up more and more. And especially if you're in a league that you're able to trade pieces, you don't have to spend a top 25 running back on Rex Burkhead, but you get him over the first four weeks. He's going to be worth so much. He's going to be a great DFS play. But people are going to be like, oh my God, he's the running back I should have drafted. Oh, I should have taken him over Duke Johnson. And you're going to be able to trade him. Because once Julian Edelman comes back, he's going to lose some of that pass catching uh, that he's going to have over the first four weeks. But Rex Burkhead, he was pretty stable, man, when he was on the field last year. He was good. Very good. Yeah, and to know that New England trusts him enough to re-sign him uh, to a multi-year deal, it kind of tells me that that he's going to be a part of their offense. I think we've always talked about that. And I'm slowly moving him up to like that that high-end RB3, low-end RB2 conversation. So let me give you four names. Tell me if you're drafting Rex Burkhead above them. Okay. Jamal Williams. Yes. Kenyon Drake. No, I'm not there yet. I'm close. Derrick Henry. No. Okay, it's really, I've got him right behind Derrick Henry and Kenyon Drake. Well, if it's a PPR format, let me specify here. PPR, Derrick Henry takes a tumble in my rankings. He he drops down to like carry on Johnson territory. But if you're in standard or half PPR, I believe like once you get to the point of where, if I'm choosing between Derrick Henry and Jay Ajayi, I'm going Derrick Henry. Why? Because Derrick Henry plays like he's a better NFL player. That's where I'm at with it. And like... They're in similar situations where they have a timeshare they're worried about. Like, Deion Lewis is going to play. He's going to get that. The offensive line is really good in, in Tennessee, too, so you can't say Jay Ajayi is so much better. Uh, I just believe in the player more, and that's why I would draft Derrick Henry higher than Jay Ajayi. What about Sony Michelle? You taking Rex Burkhead or Sony Michelle? <sighs> You're getting into my feels right now. Um Sony Michelle, I want to see him get back in the practice field because we heard 10 days. We don't, So that should be coming up in a few days now. I want to see him get back on the field. Uh, this so, so this is kind of like a loaded question. If he comes back to practice next week, I'll draft Sony Michelle ahead of Rex Burkhead. I'm drafting him tonight. Bef- while everyone else is panicking, give me Sony Michelle because he could have a huge season. Way more upside than Rex Burkhead. I've got him in the seventh round of best ball drafts the last few days. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, granted, I'm still taking Carlos Hyde ahead of him, so maybe I can get Carlos Hyde and Sony Michelle in back-to-back rounds. I haven't been getting as much Sony Michelle because Carlos Hyde's going so late, but yeah, I really want Sony Michelle right now. So, what's your take on Drake, though? Like, how are you approaching this? So, hold on a second. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna set up my stance here for you because Kenyon Drake is very talented. I think we saw that last year. Now, the defenses that he played were they great? Maybe not, but still, he he played really well. And I, I've said it before: to walk into a starting job from a backup, it's a different role than being the guy, right? So, Frank Gore was brought in. But here's the issue. Here's the reason that the the Frank Gore signing makes no sense to me then. It makes no sense now. Frank Gore has been really good for a really long time, but he's the type of player who will get you anywhere from two to five yards per carry. Okay, what I mean by that is he's not going to take a loss. He's not going to bounce around outside. He knows exactly what he is. He's going to fall forward for the yardage, and he's going to get you consistent two to five yards. He's like the Alex Smith of running backs over the, like, you know, going back a couple years. Oh, so you mean he's going to break out and be a top three position this year? Is that what you're saying about Frank Gore? Except he's like 90. Okay. <laughs> but if, if he played on a team that had a legitimate defense that was going to shut down people and they wanted him to, to kill clock, Frank Gore would be a great pick. But the reason that I didn't like him in Indianapolis last year, the reason I don't like him in Miami this year is because they have crap defenses and they're not going to finish as a top 10 unit. As a matter of fact, the Dolphins are probably going to be a bottom 10 unit. So why do you want a guy like Frank Gore? I don't understand the moves that the Dolphins have done this offseason. I stand by that. The the Albert Wilson, Danny Amendola thing is a joke. Frank Gore coming there. Again, I guys, don't take this as me not liking Frank Gore, the guy. He seems like he's an awesome dude. He's been really good for a long time. When I talk about this stuff, like David Johnson, I'm not saying I hate the player. I'm talking about the situation. And Frank Gore is a, a terrible player for Miami. Yeah, I agree, man. And uh, I, I also have a grudge against Frank Gore because my friend is a 49ers fan, and we were roommates in college. He used to always whoop me with Frank Gore, just run it down my throat, and I couldn't stop him. So <laughs> um, I, I just don't know about this situation. I'm not a Kalen Blage guy. I think he sees, what, 20 touches this year? 40 touches this year. <laughs> I'm not buying it whatsoever. But this is not a good offense. And Kenyon Drake is going to split some touches with Frank Gore. Maybe some goal line touches. I just don't really want... I, I, I'd rather take a big shot on Sonny Michelle or Derrick Henry or Carlos Hyde 
than I would just kind of, eh, Kenny Drake. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I wrote a player profile on Kenyon Drake, and I, I kind of outlined it there. I said, if you're looking for someone who's going to win you your league, I think you're doing it wrong. I think he's a guy that can give you RB2 numbers more often than not, but it's going to be somewhat boring production because he's on a bad team. Uh, but he is talented. And so when I talk about, you know, we talked about Isaiah Crowell last year and that he's going to get a lot of touches, but they're going to be bad touches in terms of a bad offense, um, in terms of him not being very talented. The reason I would take someone like Kenyon Drake or LaShawn McCoy is because they're really talented running backs and they can overcome some of that stuff. So here's my next tier. After Rex Burkhead, it goes Jamal Williams, Marlon Mack, Deion Lewis. After that, I mean, there's a pretty big drop off. So I would say that's the end of the tier is Jamal Williams, Marlon Mack, Deion Lewis, and that's that concludes my top 30 running backs. Where do you have those guys? Wait, you don't have Carrion Johnson in there? I don't have Carrion Johnson in there, nope. I, I think that this Detroit back, I don't think it's Carrion Johnson's job, man. I think it's going to be split three, maybe four ways. Did you watch this kid? Like, seriously? Sure, he looks good. You know who else looked good? You know who looked better? Amir Abdullah. Well, Amir Abdullah was playing with backups, though. That's true. <laughs> but no, no, seriously, if you guys, if you guys go and do the, the game pass, do the free seven day trial that NFL.com forward slash fantasy pros, go and watch carry on Johnson run the football. Like he looked better than I thought he would like. And I was, uh, I was, a, I was a fan of carry on Johnson watching him in college at Auburn, but sometimes these things don't translate. We don't know how the team's going to play them. He looked every bit the running back that they wanted in the second round. Uh, they obviously drafted him high in the second round. So don't be shocked if LeGarrette Blunt doesn't make this team, man. If, if, if Carrion Johnson continues to impress the way he did, um, he's in that tier for me. And did you have Marshawn Lynch in the, in the tier above this one then? I had Marshawn Lynch like eight tiers earlier, <laughs> man. I've got him, I've got him with Royce Freeman, Marshawn Lynch, Jay Ajayi, Alex Collins, Lamar Miller. Oh, that's fantastic. I have Lynch in this. Deion Lewis, Carrion Johnson, Marlon Mack. Whoa, dude, why? It, are you just that big of a Doug Martin believer? Well, I'm slowly changing my tune on that one after seeing Lynch. Cause again, I don't, I don't care if a player scores two touchdowns. Like David Njoku, yes, he scored two touchdowns and a lot of people are really geeked about that. That's fine. But what I saw with Marshawn Lynch, I just saw a guy that was moving extremely well, better than I thought he would at his age. Um, so I, I, I've started to turn the tide there. So I'm moving Lynch up where I'm, I, I'd have a tough time deciding right now who I wanted Lynch, carry on Johnson, Dion <laughs> Lewis in that tier. Oh, you're making me so sad, dude. Marshawn Lynch in the second half was a top 12 running back. He was awesome once he finally got on the field and got in shape. I'm a huge – every expert we've had on the show has been a huge believer. I can't believe they haven't – nobody's changed your mind on him. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on a second, though. We just talked about Kenyon Drake, right, and the fact they signed Frank Gore. Frank Gore, I think we can say that Doug Martin, Frank Gore – for Doug Martin, way over Frank Gore. But also Oakland's offense, way over the Dolphins' offense. No, no, and that's what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, like, no matter how you feel about their talent from a talent standpoint, the Raiders could have gone out and got, got Frank Gore, but they wanted Doug Martin. J John Gruden loves him, okay? If he's going to have a role similar to what Frank Gore does in Miami, why are we all of a sudden putting Marshawn Lynch way over Kenyon Drake? Like, I don't think that that's fair to do. If you want to say they're in the, in the same tier, I'm fine with that. But it's just tough for me to – Lynch has a better offensive line in Oakland for sure. I will bet you Marshawn Lynch has twice as many touchdowns as Kenyon Drake this year. Well, I'm not going to bet that because the Dolphins' offense is going to be bad. That's what I'm saying. That's the difference. Yeah, I know it's no. That's the thing. I can see why people want to like Lynch, but I, I try and bring up the other points. Sure. The, the reason you could be a little skeptical. We will. We want to give you guys every perspective, and like you know, there's certain players that we're really low on. We haven't mentioned Isaiah Crowell. A ton of other people would have already mentioned Isaiah Crowell. I don't know if we were planning on mentioning this show tags, but I mean, so many people are drafting him. Like, okay, just how low do you have him? We're through 30 running backs right now. I've got Crowell outside my top 40. So I'm pulling it up right now. I have Crowell at 46. Okay. Yeah, I've got him 41. Right ahead of CJ Anderson, Matt Breida, Giovanni Bernard, Chris Ivory. Like, that's where he belongs in my mind. I don't think... I don't know if he's even the starter. I, I actually, Bilal Powell's the starter if you go by their, the first team reps. And, you know, that's what we should look for in the preseason. Who is getting the reps with the first team? Bilal Powell was the guy this, uh, in the first week. And now Isaiah Crowell suffered a concussion in that game. So he's not even playing in preseason week two. I happen to think this is Bilal Powell's job. I think that Isaiah Crowell is just going to be a one, two down guy. And it, unless the Jets are in a lead, it's going to be really tough to trust him. So like, you're going to have to pick your spots with him. So people drafting him with a top 30 running back pick. I think you guys are nuts. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that is just absurd to me. I saw him go really high in one, a best ball draft earlier today. I don't remember. Was it like seventh round or something? I, I was ready to puke. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I would seriously take, I think I'd take TJ Yeldon over him. TJ Yeldon, man, where is he on my list? Whoa, he's okay. Yeah, a lot of people are, are, are really down on him, and that's fine. But I, I happen to think that he's going to have a bigger role in the passing game than people think. Um, He was really good in that role last year. I mean, I just think that there's a lot of similarities between guys like him, Tariq Cohen, and um, Chris Thompson. Like, TJ Yeldon has looked like a fantastic receiver the last couple seasons. He's slimmed down since his rookie year. Um, He's fresh when he comes into the game, and if Leonard Fournette misses any time, suddenly you have an every-week starter. Mm-hmm. Tex, did you see the the article I posted yesterday about my uh, my crazy fantasy football league? You are such a weirdo. So Bobby calls me a nerd <laughs> on this show, and like he he posted this thing. He's like, I don't know if you guys would be interested. And I clicked on it. I was like, nope. And I like literally <laughs> turned the other way. I was like, what is he doing? Like I don't. I, you can go ahead and explain that. One. Yeah. So we've got the league going on the the listener league. It's our official listener league with Sleeper App, and Sleeper App is awesome to use. I'm pretty pumped about uh, doing those listener leagues, but I also did one because I've been doing this free market league. It's something that I created. I'm really big into strategy board games, and so I thought, you know, I heard about somebody saying uh, about vampire leagues on Twitter. I wish I could remember so I could credit them. Like a vampire league is where you've got one owner who doesn't even draft. He just picks up from the waiver wire, and if he wins a game, he gets to steal a player from the opposing team. And so eventually he can build stronger and stronger, and I was like, I want to build a whole league of stuff like this. And so I did it. And it's uh, with my free market concept. It's it's way too long to talk about on the podcast. But if you want to look at it, just Google free market league. It'll come up first. And you can enter to try to compete against me in it. It's an absolute blast. And Tex doesn't know what he's missing out on. No, He's I mean, the real dork. We're the cool people. If I had time, I would 100% get into stuff. I, I, I just can't find a time to do anything like, like, like that. Like that's going to take some serious dedication. So if you're like one of those looking for a diehard league, I think that sounds really fun. Well, thanks, man. Okay, so let's move on here to the next tier. Ronald Jones, Rashad Penny, Tariq Cohen, Aaron Jones. I don't know what to do with any of these four guys, so I just lumped them all into the same tier. Chris Carson could be in there, too. <laughs> I wouldn't. I don't know if I would drop Ronald Jones down that far. Uh, I would still consider Ronald Jones in the t- in the tier with like carry on Tevin Coleman and Marlon Mack. I think that's where he belongs for me because these are guys who they may not be guaranteed a starting job, but the, they have a three down ability that could come in and be like a top 12 running back. And that's kind of where I'm at with him. Like I like Ronald Jones. I think he's, I think he's going to be fine. I think that the whole Peyton Barber thing is being a bit overblown and people might look back at this and say, I mean, it was Peyton Barber. What was I thinking? Uh, I think that's possible. I, and again, if, if the Bucks, if they really, really liked Peyton Barber, then they wouldn't have drafted Ronald Jones. Uh, he's been on the roster for three years. He was undrafted for a reason, yada, yada. Um, but in regards to like the, this next tier, it's like, this is the ugly, this is the bench running backs or guys. If you go, if you go like wide receiver heavy and you're just looking to stack a bunch of running backs, Tariq Cohen could give you some usable weeks in like PPR. Duke Johnson's in this tier for me, Bilal Powell, Chris Thompson. That's where these running backs are at. Um, it all depends on what you're looking for, right? I have Aaron Jones in that tier with those guys because if you're looking for a guy on your bench that can deliver top 12 upside, Aaron Jones belongs in that conversation. Nick Chubb was another one that I kind of I wanted to lump there, but as of now, it seems like this is definitely Carlos Hyde's job. The reason that I'm souring on Jamal Williams is because he's going to start the year, the first two games, they play against the Bears, who just got Roquan Smith under contract, and then they're going to play the Vikings. So Jamal Williams is probably not going to look great in the first two weeks, so they might decide when Aaron Jones comes back, let's give him, let's let's see what he could do with the job, and might not think about who the competition was that Jamal Williams was playing. So that's the reason that Aaron Jones is like, uh, he's definitely a guy that I wouldn't mind having on my bench at all. Sure. Yeah, I agree with you. Like, what is his upside? Could he be a top five running back, top 10? I mean, he plays for one of the best offenses in the NFL, and they're lacking some receiving options. So I do think that he's definitely got top 10 of upside. I don't know if I'd go as high as top five. It just seems like Ty Montgomery is going to be involved more than I think some people want to admit. But I do think that he's got top 10 upside. If for whatever reason, let's say Jamal Williams misses time, and if you have Aaron Jones and Ty Montgomery splitting the work there, Aaron Jones is going to get the bulk of work on first to second down. So he's the one that you would want. He's the one who's going to get the goal line carries. Agree. I haven't heard you mention Deion Lewis right now. Where do you have him? His ECR right now, that's expert consensus rankings, is 24. ADP, that's average draft position, 27. I mean, we're into like 35 running backs now. I haven't heard you say his name. Yeah, he was in the tier with uh, like Carry On and Tevin Coleman. Uh, I think that that's the tier he belongs in, where the, where it's like they're going to give you some production, that's for sure. Uh, but we don't think it, they might not have the starting job right away. I've gotten to the point where I'd take Carry On over Deion Lewis because it seems like Tennessee wants Derrick Henry to be the guy, and they want Deion Lewis to supplement him. And I think it's really between those two. I think it's going to come down to game script, where if if their team is winning, Derrick Henry is going to 
to see, you know, 70% of the touches. If the team is losing, he's probably going to see like 30 or 40%. So that you're going to have a bit of up and down there with Derrick Henry. Uh, but Deion Lewis, like Tennessee has started to turn their defense around a little bit. Their secondary especially has gotten better. Uh, adding Malcolm Butler to it, adding uh, Adoree Jackson last year. Their safety play is really good. So Titans are so good this year, man. I'm telling you, they're good. I don't think they're going to be better than the Jags, but I do think they're an improving football team that, and the coaching change there is going to do wonders for them. I, I do believe they're going to be a lot better football team for sure. It's a, it's turning into a tougher division, you know, with Andrew Luck back. Um, but still. Yeah. And Deshaun Watson, man, that's, that's a stacked division actually. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. So, I mean, Deion Lewis to me is kind of like in that he's in the Tevin Coleman conversation where that's kind of, I think the production you should expect. Okay. All right. Well, now we're moving on to the players who it's like, well, I mean, I guess they'll fill out the end of my bench. You're not really expecting anything from them. And a lot of people are just like, well, I'll get Gio Bernard. He'll get some touches and I can use him for bye weeks. You want upside guys, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not into drafting Gio Bernard much. Like, I don't think he's bad if you get to, like, the ninth, tenth round. Like, that's fine. Ninth or tenth round, you're going to take Gio Bernard? I'm fine with him there. What? Like, when, when you start, hold on a second, when you start looking at, like, the landscape of everything where players start going, I'm fine with it. I'd take him to the 15th. <laughs> He's not falling to the 15th. His ADP right now is running back 51. Yeah, so if you, it, well, so maybe his ADP is what? So 11th round maybe? Is that where he's going? I, I would think that's 13th. Let me look at the overall ADP. Keep talking about him while I look. I have him as RB46, so I'm not like high on Gio Bernard or anything like that, but I do think that he can give you RB3 numbers. He's kind of like a James White in that category where it's like he's going to have some weeks where he gives you some performances, but if something happens to Joe Mixon, all of a sudden Gio Bernard is going to have you know starting upside. We saw that down the stretch last year when Mixon went down, so... Yeah, I think he's, again, he's someone that falls into that category with the running backs like TJ Yeldon, who are going to give you some production. And if you need him as a flex, like a, you know, like let's just say you're trying to fill out a spot in the flex, I think they can give you a, a semi decent floor, but they have a massive ceiling should the starter go down. ADP 145, by the way. He's going in the 13th round after guys like Devontae Booker, Ooh. Kenny Galladay. Yuck. I'd take Bernard over those guys. I would too, but I mean, there's other guys way behind him that I'd take. So, I mean, like Samaje Piran, we haven't even mentioned him yet. He's going undrafted in most leagues. I think he's the starter right now. I don't know what to do with that, but yeah, I'll take a starter in the 13th round. Well, I was just looking at this, so I pulled it up. Corey Clement is going as the RB44 is the 120th player. So that's at the end of the 10th round. That's crazy. Like, I think Gio Bernard should go before Corey Clement. I think he should go before De uh, Deontay Foreman, who's going at 122. So that's what that's the reason I got that that range around that you know the tenth. So maybe it's maybe it's tenth or eleventh round based on where he's being drafted. But Giovanni Bernard can play a role on your fantasy team. He's not sexy by any means, though. Yeah. So we're past the tier where we're talking about you know C.J. Anderson, Tariq Cohen, Chris Carson, Aaron Jones. After that, I mean, who are, who are some guys you're looking at targeting? Because obviously everyone else is in the same tier. I love Jordan Wilkins. I want all the Jordan Wilkins. I think he, I'd say it's 40, 60. He's going to be the starter. Uh, Marlon Max probably got a 60% chance where it's just a split workload, but Wilkins could be very good this season. He's got a high ceiling. I've got P Ryan in there who I'd love to get. My, Matt Breida. We've seen what Shanahan's done with two running backs and Breida is a super athlete. Yeah, he's a little banged up right now, but I think he's got a nice floor. Uh, some other guys here, James White. You've mentioned he's got an upside. Look how he was used in the playoffs last year. Patriots can utilize him and then a bunch of handcuffs, not direct handcuffs to my guys, but the best handcuffs from around the league. I'll get to those guys in a second. But Tags, who are some guys you're targeting here? Yeah, I mean, that's my my ninth tier is is where we get to these guys. It's like Doug Martin, Samaj P. Ryan, or Rob Kelly, whoever wins that job there. I think Rob Kelly is the one who's expected to win. Um, Matt Breida, as you mentioned, Deontay Foreman. But Foreman, I, I think he starts the year on the pup list, so if he does, then he's not draftable. Latavius Murray, uh, he falls into this category. James White, as you mentioned. Uh, if you're in a PPR league, James White is worth a draft pick. I, I'm just going to tell you that right now. I also think that Ty Montgomery is worth a draft pick. I think he's worth starting, man, as a as a flex play. Over the first four weeks, I actually 100% agree with you on that one. And so these are guys that we mentioned yesterday on the podcast where we talked about the Al potential Alvin Kamara's. These are guys with three down capability. Now, Ty Montgomery may not be the most, um, you know, he might be fragile, and that's the concern there. James White might be a little, he might be small, but Deion Lewis was pretty small. He got it done in that offense. So again, these are these guys are going to give you. There, there's going to be two touchdown we, uh, weeks for each of them. Like James White's going to have two touchdown weeks. It happens every single season. Uh, Ty Montgomery could be that guy because when you look at the landscape and how Aaron Rodgers has been really upset 
about the lack of pass catchers that they've surrounded with him, all these inexperienced guys that he's really upset about. Ty Montgomery's been there for a long time, and he can play multiple roles in the team. And if and remember, he was the starter going into last year with Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams on the team. So let's not forget about Ty Montgomery. I agree. Yeah, he was being drafted super early. Um, so let's talk about this next tier, and these are the guys that I'm drafting at the end of the draft. And I've mentioned before, I don't draft a kicker, I don't draft a defense, unless I'm drafting like right before the season starts. And the reason why is what happened with Kareem Hunt last year. I drafted him in early leagues all over the place, just in case Spencer Ware got hurt, and look what happened. Every single season, some running back, just like Darius Geis, is going to get hurt. And if it's one of these guys in a great offense and you've got their direct backup who becomes a bell cow, they could be an RB1. And so these are the guys I'm targeting, okay? I only go for backup running backs who could be RB1s. Otherwise, they're just not worth rostering. And eventually, yeah, I'm probably going to drop most of these guys. But there's a chance one of them's going to be an absolute home run. First, Latavius Murray. Uh, you've got Spencer Ware. Again, imagine if Kareem Hunt goes down. Spencer Ware, we've already seen him be an RB1. Uh, we've got Rod Smith from Dallas. We haven't talked about him much. I saw you draft him in the best ball draft earlier today, Tags. James Conner from Pittsburgh. And then my very favorite, John Kelly from the Los Angeles Rams, could be a star if Todd Gurley was to go down. They're all great. These are all great ones at the end of your draft. And people ask us all the time, should I draft a handcuff? You know, when do you draft your handcuff? You don't ever aim for a handcuff. Like, I don't do that. Like, what, what I do is I base the, the running backs I'm adding at the end of my roster. I'm, at, I'm putting them there based on the potential that they have if the starter were to go down. I'm not drafting someone like, you know, uh, I won't draft, uh, who's a guy, uh, Austin Eckler. I'm not going to draft him with my last draft pick. I would rather take someone like Spencer Ware or Rod Smith because even if Melvin Gordon got hurt, they're not going to give Austin Ackler 15 touches per game. That's just not going to happen, guys. So I'm off Justin Jackson, by the way. I've mentioned him a bunch of times. He just doesn't look as impressive as I thought he would. So forget Justin Jackson. Yeah, so he's actually apparently on the roster bubble, but they need someone to step into that role. So it wouldn't be surprised me if they signed someone for depth in the Chargers if Jackson, for whatever reason, doesn't make the roster. But uh, yeah, we're, when we're talking about this, like don't chase your your own running back's handcuff. If you end up with your own running backs, that's fine if that's where he fell in your list. But Exactly. So you don't need to reach for that player is what I'm saying. Okay, a couple other guys that I forgot to mention. Jeremy Hill. Yeah, we probably should mention him. Like, how are you approaching him? Like, let's say that you're in a 12-team, 16-man roster league. Do you think he's worth a draft pick? Not in that league. In a 14-team league or in a 12-team league where you've got a bunch of bench spots, yeah, Jeremy Hill's a guy that I want. Because just imagine, I mean... You've seen it happen before, where some random guy becomes the the Patriots starter and he's awesome. Jeremy Hill's been awesome before. He could be a touchdown machine, just like LeGarrette Blunt, who's kind of a lousy football player. Jeremy Hill's a lot like LeGarrette Blunt, actually. So I could see it happening. Another guy, Chase Edmonds, in much deeper leagues for Arizona. I think he's the direct backup. I do. I don't think that's a split backfield. If uh, David Johnson was to go down again, I think it's Chase Edmonds. Yeah, Chase Edmonds, they've said that he's the, the definite backup uh, to David Johnson, so that's definitely something worth monitoring. And I, I like the the parallel between LeGarrette Blunt and Jeremy Hill is, is is closer than people think because like when you when you talk about LeGarrette Blunt, you remember his when he broke onto the the scene in Tampa Bay, I think it was 2010, 2011. Uh he had a year where he kind of just broke out, over a thousand yards and all that. And everybody was like, "Wow, this guy had some highlight reels in college. He knocked out a dude on the sideline." Like all of a sudden LeGarrette Blunt was a thing. The next year he he was okay, and then he fell off the map and like people forgot who LeGarrette Blunt was. All of a sudden he pops back up on the in the Patriots roster, and it's kind of like, okay, can they make something out of him? And he was kind of like mediocre for a few years, and then he broke out for an 18-touchdown season. I don't think that's going to happen with Jeremy Hill, but the fact, if Sony Michelle were to miss a lot of time, I absolutely think it's a possibility with Jeremy Hill, because Jeremy Hill, don't forget, like, Jeremy Hill won fantasy leagues his rookie year. Like, legitimately, Gio Bernard went down, he got hurt, and Jeremy Hill was essentially Todd Gurley back in 2014, I think it was, his rookie year. Like, I remember that stretch because he won me fantasy championships uh, down the stretch there. So he absolutely has it in him. He's been a great goal line back over the last three years. So yeah, Jeremy Hill, I'm starting to lean towards it. The, the more time Sony Michelle misses, the more I'm kind of like into Jeremy Hill. Another guy, Doug Martin, but he's being drafted a lot earlier. So, I mean, he's all these guys we've been mentioning, they're not even being drafted. You can get them for, for free. Doug Martin, you've got to go get him in the 13th, maybe even 12th round if you want him. But, I mean, I could see him doing really well in Oakland. He's been healthy for two years. In those two years, he was a top 10 running back. Yeah, it's hard to find someone that has multiple 1,400-yard seasons just sitting there at the end of your draft. Yeah, 
but Doug Martin is kind of that guy. And if something happens to Marshawn Lynch, Doug Martin's going to be a thing in fantasy. Do you think, you know, we're, we're seeing who Washington's going to end up with. Maybe it'll be Amir Abdullah. Maybe somebody else will be cut and then they'll end up signing him. They'll take over the job like Alex Collins did. What about Eddie Lacy? I know Eddie Lacy was really fat <laughs> and he, he didn't work out, but this is somebody who's done it before. Is he somebody that you would maybe be interested in in much deeper leagues? I am not even lying to you. I searched for Eddie Lacy like a news item the other day. Like I was legitimately going through my rankings, updating things, and I saw Eddie Lacy was left off my things, off my rankings, and I was like, I wonder what's going on with Eddie Lacy. I haven't heard any news. So I actually did a Google search of him. There is no news on Eddie Lacy. Like he, he, he might, he might as well have disappeared off the face of the earth. He's Carlos Williams now. Uh, he might be. I mean, Carlos Williams is probably in better shape. I don't know, man. Carlos Williams eats a lot of... Yeah, he's definitely in better shape than Eddie Lacy. Though. <laughs> I, I just remember looking for Carlos Williams, and I was like, I'll go check out his Twitter. Maybe that'll tell me something. And he was like, yeah, I ate like a thousand chicken wings tonight or something <laughs> weird like that. So I don't know. Him and Eddie Lacy are probably hanging out right now. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I think Eddie Lacy's time in the NFL is done. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, there's really no one else to talk about. If we didn't mention somebody... There's a reason we didn't mention them. Like, there's no sense in drafting Buck Allen. Unless it's a full PPR league, I could see him having some value. Wayne Gallman, forget about it, okay? None of these, none of the rest of these guys are even worth considering in my mind. Wayne Gallman's the handcuff, I think, too. I don't think Jonathan Stewart's the handcuff. I think it's Wayne Gallman to Saquon Barkley. I think it's Stewart. Okay. But, I mean... Again, not very exciting. And Naheem Hines, he's someone we should have mentioned. Sorry, Naheem Hines is fine for PPR leagues. Yeah, he's uh, he's kind of like in that Gio Bernard territory, but lesser. I think he's lesser. I think he's more like Corey Clement, uh, where it's like you're taking a shot on him because apparently he hasn't uh, caught up with the playbook as fast as they would like. Um, we didn't mention Nick Chubb either. Okay, I got to stop talking about running backs where this show's never going to end. Tags, <laughs> why don't you go stat of the day, man? All right. So uh, a, a weird stat was that I found that Matt Ryan was the only quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards last year and not finish in the top 10 fantasy quarterbacks. So what does this mean? Because I always try and give context to be like, OK, what does that mean, Mike? That means that Matt Ryan just he just failed to throw for as many touchdowns as he should have. And I think that trans that, that goes further into Julio Jones and why Julio Jones uh, didn't score more touchdowns last year. So I think you should be looking at positive regression. And even though that Kyle Shanahan left, Matt Shan or, or Matt Ryan still threw for 4,000 yards. Um, so that's a positive, right? They, they talked about this off season, Sarkeesian, you know, learning from his mistakes last year and kind of building on that. Matt Ryan's a veteran quarterback. He's like in the prime of his career. They just added Calvin Ridley. Uh, so Matt Ryan could take a step back forward this year. He's actually due for one. If you split the difference between his touchdown rate in 2016 in 2017, he would have thrown 29 touchdown passes last year. He only had 20. He would have been a top eight fantasy quarterback again. Pro Football Focus graded Matt Ryan as their number two quarterback, if I'm remembering right. I mean, this guy's still really good. I know Jalen Ramsey said he's a bum and he's overrated and it was all about Kyle Shanahan. I love Jalen Ramsey. That interview was awesome. Um, but I still believe in Matt Ryan. I'm drafting him in the top men, uh, where it's like you're taking a shot on him because apparently he hasn't uh, caught up with the playbook as fast as they would like. Um, we didn't mention Nick Chubb either. Okay, I got to stop talking about running backs where this show's never going to end. Tags, <laughs> why don't you go stat of the day, man? <laughs> All right. So uh, a, a weird stat was that I found that Matt Ryan was the only quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards last year and not finish in the top 10 fantasy quarterbacks. So... What does this mean? Because I always try and give context to be like, okay, what does that mean, Mike? That means that Matt Ryan just he just failed to throw for as many touchdowns as he should have. And I think that trans that that goes further into Julio Jones and why Julio Jones uh, didn't score more touchdowns last year. So I think you should be looking at positive regression. And even though that Kyle Shanahan left, Matt Shan or, or Matt Ryan still threw for four thousand yards. Um, so that's a meant uh, where it's like you're taking a shot on him because apparently he hasn't uh, caught up with the playbook as fast as they would like. Um, we didn't mention Nick Chubb either. Okay, I got to stop talking about running backs where this show's never going to end. Tags, why don't you go stat of the day, man? <laughs> All right. So uh, a, a weird stat was that I found that Matt Ryan was the only quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards last year and not finish in the top 10 fantasy quarterbacks. So what does this mean? Because I always try and give context to be like, okay, what does that mean, Mike? That means that Matt Ryan just – he just failed to throw for as many touchdowns as he should have. And I think that trans that, that goes further into Julio Jones and why Julio Jones – uh, didn't score more touchdowns last year. So I think you should be looking at positive regression. And even though that Kyle Shanahan left, Matt Shana or, or Matt Ryan still threw for 4,000 yards. Um, so that's a positive, right? They, they talked about this offseason, Sarkeesian, you know, learning from his mistakes last year and kind of building on that. 
Matt Ryan's a veteran quarterback. He's like in the prime of his career. They just added Calvin Ridley. Uh, so Matt Ryan could take a step back forward this year. He's actually due for one. If you split the difference between